Good morning. Welcome to the Renewable Energy Standard Working Group. Calling our meeting to order. And I don't actually have any opening comments. You want to walk us through the agenda, Jen? That would be great. Sure. So opening comments, agenda review, and announcements per the norm. And then a brief summary presentation from TJ Poor, the Director of Regulated Utility Planning at the Vermont Department of Public Service. So that will be relatively brief for the amount of content he may have to cover. So he's available throughout this meeting to answer questions and integrate some of that information into the conversation as needed. And then the bulk of this meeting, it's um, between 9 and 11.15, so almost two hours for a discussion. Thank you so much to all of you for filling out the poll results. It's kind of, it's amazing that I, I think without exception, everyone on the working group is able to give some responses. So using the poll results as a springboard, we're roughly organized by tier one, tier two, tier three, and then the general overall standard. So that two block of time will move into a chronological order by the poll. I don't know that you're going to get through all of that content at this meeting still, but one thing that I do want to know is that there's a good chunk of time at the end of this meeting to talk about next steps, and you have another meeting next week, sort of back-to-back. -back. So whatever you don't cover today, you'll cover then. So 11.15 is when we have two breaks, approximate timing at 9.45 and 11.05. Again, that's approximate depending on what feels right and where you happen to be in the conversation. By 11.15, however, we will, after coming back from that second break, stop for public comment. And then move into around 11.30, forecasting where the conversation goes here and thinking a little bit about what you might want to do to prepare between this meeting and your next. Adjourn by noon. Any questions about the agenda? Looks like there are no questions. Um, Frank, do you have any announcements that you need to make at the start of the meeting? Uh, no. That's it? <laughs> I don't either. Beautiful, beautiful drive in this morning. I'll take that. Yes. Um, PJ, you want to join us? Morning, everybody. Morning. Peter, for joining me in the witness chair here. <laughs> Anything you don't know, I'll just pitch in. Okay. <laughs> I don't have to talk very much. <laughs> or maybe a lot. Okay, so I am uh, going to share here just a few slides really quickly that are uh, going to present where we are with our technical analysis. Um, I think most of you know we've been working on this for quite a while. Um, you know, and uh, we're still in really draft. You're going to see draft all over these slides. I have a bunch of caveats in here we'll get to, but we'll just kind of give you examples of the kind of information we're getting uh, and that it's all going to change um, really soon. We, we've had a uh, technical workshop a couple of weeks ago where we got a lot of good feedback uh, and we're modifying the uh, model accordingly. And so um, just, to, just to kind of remind us where we are, uh, you know, we presented on modeling scenarios a few weeks ago here um, that we got even before we started a stakeholder advisory group, we had modeling scenarios, uh, a stakeholder input on scenarios that went into the RFP to select our consultant. And then we had a stakeholder nominated stakeholder advisory group that represented a wide variety of perspective that had four meetings to help shape the assumptions and the inputs and give feedback on the results. We presented the results, like I said, a couple of weeks ago. All the materials are available online. The model itself is available. We can't really post it online. It's like 120 megabytes or something huge. And so it's really challenging to get up there and for people to download, but we can get you access if you want the draft model. Uh, Brattle Group has it. So they're, you know, the work that you all are doing with Brattle Group, they'll be able to translate kind of the results and they're kind of putting those links together now so they can take the outputs of the SEA model and use as inputs. For, uh, for the macroeconomic modeling that Brattle is doing. Um, we're, 
we've asked for further feedback after that October 10th meeting. We gave two weeks for further feedback on it. We've gotten some in the meantime, but we're expecting that we'd get more today. Uh, and continuing the model edits with final results um, early November. So, you know, we're going to, I think, by next week have mostly final results and then have another chance to look at that and say, okay, are there other tweaks we need to make? Um, just a sense of the feedback, the type of feedback that we've gotten, um, really at a high level that I'll just say there's been appreciation for the approach, uh, how we've been sharing this throughout transparency and access to the model and analysis and our consultants and the department staff. Um, the As far as the technical presentation of the draft results, this stuff is weedy, right? It gets really into the weeds. We got significant feedback on just how we should present things. Should we look at just incremental costs or should we be looking at total costs of a renewable energy standard? Um, feedback both ways on that, actually. Uh, presentation style, like where we should put emphasis, and what we might want to show. Um, just different ways to clarify the draft results. And then other substantive questions, um, like why does the regional mix look the way it does when you, you know, in the scenario, which when we investigated it caused a really big change. I'll get into that uh, in a minute. But, uh, and, uh, you know, there's other certain results on questions that weren't necessarily intuitive that actually caused their, they, ultimately they were results of kind of an assumption that was made deep in the model that wasn't necessarily indicative of Vermont. And so all of this feedback was really, really helpful. Um, so this presentation, this is my caveat slide. Um, so there's gonna be a bunch of charts. Um, they're really illustrative of the results that you're going to see, but they're not the results that you're going to see. So um, I think it was important to kind of share, you know, this is where we are today, but share kind of the types of results with, you know, societal impacts, rate impacts that you're going to see, kind of the stacking benefits and costs. But then um, you're going to see caveats all through here. The substantive results will change. The format of the presentation will change a little bit. These are all really just examples. Um, I have some examples listed here, but I'll get into them in the charts uh, of how these things are going to change. Uh, so the first slide, this, this chart shows uh, societal impacts. This is incremental. Um, for the presentation, we showed all incremental societal impacts. Each of uh, the bars here represents one scenario, one of the selected scenarios. And recall, there are sensitivities for each of these in the model. Um, you know, anything above the zero line is a benefit. Anything below the zero line is a cost in the kind of the dark blue there um, going down. And uh, what those draft results, what this chart is saying is that um, the societal benefits are greater than the societal costs of every one of these scenarios. And you can see how they vary here. Um, now, that said, there are going to be a bunch of changes to this, and I've listed some of those on the right here. Um, you know, the societal greenhouse gas benefits, which is that uh, yeah, goldish bar, yellowish bar, part of the bar, that big part, um, used a, um, there was an error in the social cost of carbon calculation, um, and it's going to be smaller, um, and it was how a discount rate was applied. Uh, you know, the, the costs for clean energy standard scenarios, um, I believe those are, uh, I actually don't have that here. I believe they're scenarios one, one, three, one and three at least, but I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, but, but the costs for the clean energy scenarios are going to be, because we have these embedded contracts that already, uh, for nuclear, that already include the attributes. And so, um, in, in this original draft of the model, costs were attributed to meeting a clean energy standard where utilities would have already met that. And so that's the type of thing that, you know, these results kind of were draft and they're going to change. Um, we're going to show total as well as incremental impacts based on feedback. Um, if, if it's possible, not all charts are going to be able to do that in one chart, but we'll, we'll show both. And the last thing, the grid integration truck costs are likely to change. And by that, we have some general grid integration costs, and we've been working as a staff kind of outside 
of SEA's scope of work to say what happens when we get to certain thresholds of renewable energy that is in state. Um, this is a challenging question. The 2021 Belco Long Range Transmission Plan said, um, this is not a quote, I'm just going to generalize, but when we get to 500 megawatts of solar, we're going to have $500 million of transmission investment needed. Well, we're at 500 megawatts of solar and we haven't needed the 500, megawatt, uh, $500 million of investment. So we're trying to kind of drill down into that kind of analysis and say, okay, what would really happen if um, in-state generation landed kind of similar to how it is um, being deployed now, or what would happen if it is landed kind of um, in the spots that um, have more headroom and could take more um, solar. And, and so that's a really complicated analysis. And as I said this previously too, this is kind of like a post-processing SEA model that we feel like it's gonna be layered on top uh, afterwards. And by layered on top that maybe it's um, a zero value or a negative value that's layered on top, but there'd be something on top because there is a there is a value in the model for grid integration costs. So I just wanted to call that one out specifically. Um, so uh, this shows the incremental ratepayer costs of uh, of each scenario. And again, you have each bar it represents a scenario. You uh, can see how they vary. Um, the clean energy standard scenarios have lower rate pair impact costs on here. Um, ultimately, I, I don't I actually didn't put that line in here. Um, that it represents, um, you know, in these draft results, it was three to six percent rate impact. Um, there's an assumption on what the utilities cost of service over time is going to be as to you know create that percent impact, but we'll get a percent impact. So for me, my takeaway from those draft results, and again, they're draft subject to change, but if they didn't change, they would have kind of um, backed up what I kind of thought uh, originally is that, um, you know, uh, increases in the res will have societal benefits and they will come at a cost to ratepayers, And that is a trade-off that we all need to wrestle with. And where we, where we land on that trade-off is really what we're going to talk about during the session and where everybody has opinions. And hopefully that the results of this model, as they evolve, will you know, just be the good grounding to have that conversation on the, um, there's that particular trade-off and we all know there's, there's many other trade-offs. Um, this chart, these charts show uh, kind of the share of uh, the technology shares in different scenarios. And so on the left, it's like, hey, in 2035, scenario two, um, we'll change the colors here, but um, you know, a certain amount of solar uh, in state and out of state. I think the dark blue uh, top is solar in state, solar out of state is a small slice, a bunch of hydro still in that scenario. And some other uh, resources. And then kind of an example for scenario six, um, which had kind of the 50% regional tier, tier target um, that showed um, a, lot of, a lot more out-of-state solar, some in-state and kind of a different amount of hydro in that. So these charts are gonna change. This is one of the assumptions I talked about. It's like, well, why are these regional tiers with 50% new regional showing so much hydro? That doesn't make sense, right? And um, what it was is the assumption in the model that hydro that qualified for any other New England um, uh, portfolio standard, which included a main, main standard that allows a lot of uh, hydro has a really broad definition for new hydro, um, as I understand it. And so uh, we said, no, the regional tier in our mind is really meant to be kind of more consistent with like a mass class one, which is um, just like new, like new, new renewables, if you will, like, uh, you know, from 2010 on is how we defined it in here, but uh, new renewables. And so 
we expect this the giant hydro slice to be much much different in future results. Um, but the point, I guess, is that these are the types of slides. It's like we'll be able to say how much in state, how much um, how much out of state, what resources under kind of these sets of assumptions. There's going to be a lot of other types of results we can show. There's uh, that top left is incremental cost of renewable energy by year and by tier. Um, and, you know, we can show the top right is land use. Again, this land use is, is not, it had a lot of comments and will change, but show what kind of um, resource and what kind of uh, acreage would it, would it need, um, both in-state and regionally. Um, dollar per ton of carbon abatement. Um, this chart is relative to the uh, business as usual. And then that bottom right one, this one's a monthly surplus deficit of uh, your, the utilities load versus how much generation they will have, um, you know, based on their current entitlements, plus all the new requirements for the uh, renewable energy standard. So you'll see the lines above zero here are a surplus in certain months, like in June and July, they have a 20% surplus in energy. And in the winter, there's still a deficit. And this can be done on an hourly basis. It can be done uh, monthly, annually. But this kind of gets to that question of, okay, especially when we look at it hourly, how much load flexibility could be valuable to um, consider uh, and how should we best get that load flexibility or encourage that load flexibility to happen? Um, so th that's just kind of a sampling of those results. Um, there's a whole lot of other ones. Um, the um, final results, like I said, I think, you know, uh, early November uh, will be available. We're looking to have an, one final stakeholder advisory group to present results, see if there's any tweaks, particularly to presentation style or emphasis in presentation. Um, I need to note that we are going to ha also have a webinar on our polling results. I think it was announced at your last meeting that we did a statewide poll of uh, Vermonters, released the, the results, um, the full reports linked here, and there's a summary slides. We also are going to do a webinar. It's really our consultant. We'll introduce it, and our consultant will talk about the uh, results. And then we're going to our our plan as department is to release kind of mid November. Here's our key takeaways from all of the collective work: the polling, the regional planning commission events, the technical analysis um, in like a two pager or a few slides, and then have put that out with all the backup, of course. But put that out for public comment, we will have a public workshop uh, after Thanksgiving and have a kind of broad public comment period to wrap up our uh, the broad public engagement that we've um, that we've done. Uh, and that's it. Hopefully I've kept to the time. I wasn't I didn't have my clock in front of me. So um, if you're not on our stakeholder list, we do send out a newsletter and so you should join the, the QR code. So I'll stop there, um, see if there's any questions. I will be here throughout the meeting if things come up that um, you want to throw to me also. I've got one question online from Ken. Thanks. I hope this is quick. Um, TJ, I'm just curious, your, your last comment or chart about the um, surplus and deficit and, and flexible load management being a way to address that. Am I correct in assuming the, the cost and benefits of, of implementing that flexible load management are outside of your scope? So when you put uh, up the chart about the cost, it's not including any of that extra work? Oh, yeah, that's correct. That, so uh, I see that as the kind of the type of analysis that we can say, okay, here's the results we expect. And here's once we figure out um, what path we're taking in this next legislative session, then we can say, here's the impacts, and now we need to see what, what we need to do uh, to, to uh, address any issues that imbalance may cause. Um, so like, what are those issues, and do we need to take action? What's the most cost-effective way to do it? Um, and 
So no costs for load flexibility, platforms, technologies are included in here and no, no benefits of them either. In the room? Yep. Um, <clears throat> on that same chart, um, is there an assumption or that Vermont will start to have more and more bi-directional flow in and out of the state? So surplus months, we may become exporters to the region. I, the, so the, the physical flows in that chart are really not as, assumed. It's really just, um, you know, entitlements that utilities have owned or contracted or renewable energy standard versus the assumed load. Sorry, just and follow up. statewide. So that doesn't take into account any additional infrastructure needed to accommodate bi-directional load? Correct. Okay, thanks. Chase? Yeah, thanks. Um, TJ, you mentioned early on um, in your presentation that the social cost of carbon numbers might need to be adjusted because of the discount rate. Could you please just break that down? Like what discount rate was used? How do you anticipate those changes will show up? Um, I appreciate you. Yeah, just a little more on that, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So um, the the Climate Council has recommended a 2% discount rate um, to be used for the social cost of carbon and the social cost within the social cost of carbon calculation. And uh, the, a lot of the assumptions in our model are based on the, this regional avoided energy supply cost report uh, that states and utilities uh, participate in it every couple of years. The, um, the workbook that's associated with that model has kind of a one percent discount rate embedded, so it was like the stream of social cost of carbon numbers that you would see using a one percent that were developed with a one percent discount rate instead of the two percent that uh, was recommended by the Climate Council. And so, uh, I would expect the societal benefits to go down. Uh, you know. Uh, I, I can't actually tell you, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, um, but they would go down to the, the level value, 128, uh, 28 a ton. I don't know what they are now in the model. And then, you know, going forward, it, it almost acts as kind of a sensitivity, actually, this, this mistake, um, because, you know, there is discussion. I think I'm pretty sure the Climate Council is going to take it up over the next year plus, but there's discussion of, um, you know, it should uh, uh, those values change, the social cost of carbon chip values change. And so, uh, you know, for what it's worth, I guess we got an extra sensitivity as if, if we had a higher social cost of carbon in here. Thanks. 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 Uh, so uh, I have a couple questions for you, TJ, maybe for Carrick also, if that's acceptable. Um, so I'm just trying to think about what is in and under consideration, what is not. Maybe it's easier to say what is not, things that we know of um, in terms of the impacts here. So thinking about um, the uh, grid investments, um, the, the um, rate impacts. So For instance, is clean heat part of this? Are any, um, like, is there any modeling that's, uh, you know, looking at what will happen as a result of that? Um, what investments have been made in transmission? What are we anticipating with all of the, um, like, our IRA funded um, our investments calculated as part of this? And I apologize if this is easily knowable already. No, they're good, good questions. Um, so I'll start with the clean heat standard. There's nothing really about the clean heat standard that is involved, included in here, except a sensitivity to the load forecast. So we do have a, a high low business as usual load forecast. We didn't, we didn't bother to do a lower load forecast, but um, so in that respect, you could you could say there's there's some impacts from a, um, electrification in here. Um, there are, um, like I said, there are some 
grid integration costs included. There's also uh, there's also benefits associated with uh, you know the interconnection costs that are borne by um, uh, developers in the process. So developer. In, in the cost of power, it's assumed that the developer pays for interconnection, a portion of those costs are assumed to be a benefit that utilities would have otherwise at some point had to pay. Um, and, uh, and so they're kind of, uh, they're included on the benefit side as well. So you get the full cost of the resource, whatever PPA rate that is, but then a percentage of that kind of comes back as a benefit on the interconnection side. But there are broader grid interconnection costs included, but they're just really regional. They're, they're based on kind of national regional studies. And that's where I was getting at with like, we need to look at Vermont transmission um, issues, Vermont distribution issues, because frankly, we're not like um, every other state in the country where we have 500 megawatts of solar um, relative to a 900 megawatt load. Right. So so we want to look at that specifically that is not included now. And that's what I was talking about layering on top. And uh, then related to the um, you, know, you noted that in 2021, Boca had projected 500 million investments when we hit 500 megawatts. We're at 500 megawatts. So to what extent? So now I'm going to have two questions there. My first question was, well, how much investment has there been um, since 20? Maybe that's a question for Velco. And then a second question, I guess, for you is um, how much are the developers actually offsetting that investment in the grid? Do you do you know? Would you be able to quantify that? Uh, well, that that investment was was directly related to needing to upgrade in order to accommodate the renewable energy. So that would be. Um, uh, again, I, I think, you know, some of that investment would be say, hey, we have to upgrade this line anyway in 10 years, but it's upgraded now. And so there's some benefit associated with that. Um, but on the transmission scale, I don't I don't think that that is happening. And so on the distribution scale, that really happens a lot. But on the dis on the transmission scale, that percent of benefit doesn't really um, it, it doesn't accrue the same way to ratepayers because they're really, you know, a developer in their interconnection costs is not going to be able to swing a project if there's a um, fifteen million dollar trans uh, substation upgrade, right? So they're not going to pay for that; they'll go somewhere else to site their project. Um, but on the distribution scale, if there's a $75,000 transformer upgrade. And they say, well, we can, we might be able to make that work. Well, that might not have been upgraded for 20 years, but a portion of that could have some benefit. And so that's, that's kind of where that developer investment happens. It's on the more local, local scale. And so I guess maybe to more generalize my question, to what extent are you able to, um, quantify what's happened or project what will happen in terms of that private investment in the grid and or IRA investment in the grid. So we'll see. Uh, we're trying. Um, Velco and Kara could talk about this too, but um, well, Velco's next long range transmission plan is due 2024. So just in a few months. And so they're actually doing on the transmission scale, this analysis uh, uh, again. We're, we're kind of trying to plug into that um, in order to, uh, to use some of that information ahead of time and, you know, before the end of the year to, to, um, uh, to kind of get a sense of what the impact might be. Uh, on the distribution scale, that, that's different, right? There's going to be um, a whole different set of costs and impacts. And, uh, and benefits. And so we're uh, connecting with um, some utilities. We're probably not going to be to do it with every utility, but perhaps get a sense like with GMP. And um, I'm not sure if Lou has reached out to VEC yet or not, but to see what kind of scale we think of like in 
you know, cover 80% of the state and say, hey, what's the, um, what's the impact here? And, you know, what kind of headroom do you have? How much on different circuits? Do you know these answers now? And some of that might be unknowable, but we, where it is knowable and how much headroom entities might have, we want to try and kind of make some estimates and extrapolate and see what we can do. Um, it's definitely not going to be, you know, we're not going to, I wouldn't gamble on the result, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it'll be indicative, hopefully. Uh, if I might continue, is that okay? May I continue? Uh, so I'm going to ask a question that will probably be just pointing to many things. Right? Can you explain the difference between the transmission and distribution, which you are referencing? So I'm not sure that I understand. Sure. The transmission is really like the high voltage lines that Velcro right. owns, right? And um, distribution scale, I'm thinking like the small feeders, like as, you know, even as far down to distribution transformers, but um, really the feeders and, you know, smaller substation upgrades. And is, is there one or the other that is more likely for developers to be connected to, or does... Uh, definitely distribution. Tier two is all distribution connected. And so... Um, less likely to be impacting the transmission system. Well, so they, those just, it kind of flows up. And so... The impacts would happen first, really, I think, on the distribution system, and then, but there's other times where it can flow up and impact the transmission system. So if that makes sense in some transmission system. Um. Awesome. awesome. Think about it. Did you have a question for Karen? I mean, I could just ask questions. Well, I just <laughs> <laughs> If Karen is willing to offer a few comments on um, the questions that I've asked. I would appreciate that. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. If you have something to add. <laughs> Do I have uh, some? Last ad. <laughs> I would say the, uh, what TJ, I'll just say this, TJ's last point. The, the fact is, given where we're at, we're blessed with an abundance of in-state uh, generation and we need more. And that is having a direct impact on the transmission grid. In turn, that's having a direct impact on the federal authorities that dictate the information and how a transmission utility and a distribution utility need to interact. So that's a whole topic because we're gonna be required to have greater vision into where there is a distrib distribution utility connected generation, what kind of fuel uh, does it utilize, solar and the like. Uh, what's its inverter settings and the like. We're going to need to know because it's arrived. So congratulations. Um, in terms of there's been substantial investment, uh, I would say, Laura, thinking of your other questions. So I would add that. So we're there further. I think we talked about this at the Rev conference for the first time since 2014. We are exporting energy, uh, which is not something we have done, um, like I said, since 2014. That's a big deal. And I don't know how, and TJ, we had that conversation in the quarterly, how we might account for that. So that's something we're wrestling with. And then lastly, Laura, thinking of your question about, are there any other kind of merchant transmission driven transmission investments that impact the distribution grid? Indeed they are. We should know ostensibly this week, a fundamental discussion about whether or not it'll be a big step. It's not de facto the New England Clean Power Link TDI's project. That's in the running for transmission facilitation dollars. That decision is supposed to come from DOE this week. Last At our last check, I think it was 2015, when we examined what would that precipitate when you inject 1,000 megawatts into a 1,000 megawatt system, that was about $420, $440 million at that time. So we haven't taken, like the grid doesn't, is not in stasis. So what the new... Um, Invest, list of investments, including the price tag for those, which would be borne by the developer, what those would mean and the benefits those of those to the various distribution utilities to Velco. That remains to be written if they get a yes on the transmission facilitation program, as I said, and that decision is expected new, uh, this week. Lastly, there is a national grid project. That's an underground over in the Northeast Kingdom, smaller impact in Vermont, really. I don't, we don't see that. It'll have some impact because it is, as Lewis mentioned, it will be bi-directional. There could be some grid investments that will, that will precipitate 
that's less clear. I'll stop there. I know Brian has a comment. How many other people are sitting on comments? Um, and specifically, you'll get to talk with each other about any questions that might relate to TJ's presentation. Brian, go ahead, and then we'll come back to Senator Gray. Um, just to let you know, I have three points. So, okay. um, first of all, TJ, um, and, and to follow up on what Carrick was just talking about, incremental uh, interconnection costs. Um, I think, as you are aware, uh, NERC and FERC have been dealing with this particular topic to, you know, extensively over the last few months. And even as a result of FERC's open, open meeting last week, initiated new levels of activities for interconnection uh, data modeling and, you know, collecting modeling and all of this relative to IBRs. And they're establishing new standards for the expectation of being able to receive delivery of information relating to interconnections. So that's that. But one question that I do have is in your interconnection costs, have you considered anything relating to either the cyber or physical security requirements associated with the interconnection of these facilities, plus also the vulnerabilities and threats that will come as a result of a deepening penetration of these resources and the common mode failures that could result from um, these deepening penetrations? So I'm, I, I'm not sure, uh, actually. So there's a um, kind of the grid integration costs and they're based, like I said, they're based on kind of the national numbers. I actually am not sure every input into those. I have not heard that we've, you know, in, uh, that included is cybersecurity but, uh, and those types of issues, but I, uh, I can follow up on that okay. for you. Um, the next area uh, question I have is dealing with the, your comments about ratepayer impacts. I, I assume that those numbers are kind of looking at that as a statewide, a statewide average as opposed to utility specific. Yeah, and I should clarify that all of this is statewide. You know, those distribution impacts would be um, very utility specific, especially for some smaller utilities like yours or. Uh, I know WEC is already at capacity for at least one substation and close to another one. And so, you know, those, those would not be equal for every utility. Right. And I think to represent Sibelius' uh, common distribution, for example, we have a number of, of uh, transformers, distribution transformers that are not capable of upgrading if someone wants to come along for, um, you know, uh, net metering, we would have to replace that distribution transformer. Plus also have to take a look at the feeder lines because some of those feeder lines are 40, 50 years old and may not be geared to the fact of taking on the additional load requirements. So these are types of things that we're gonna to have to look at relative to our distribution costs. So, uh, thank you, that's helpful. With regard to your lines that are 40 or 50 years old, what is your time frame for upgrading those or hardening those? Oh, given the fact that I just came on board in the last six months, uh, this is something that we are taking a look at and we're talking with our engineers uh, team to basically take a look at what is a game plan for dealing with this circumstance, because we know that we're going to have to do some upgrades uh, across the board within our system. Um, and of course, that will mean um, yeah, uh, rate, rate adjustments that we'll have to be taking a look at and whether they'll be system wide or whether they will be specific to, um, you know, interconnection interests. That's something that we're going to have to weigh. And, and with state policy, you know, continuing to move towards beneficial electrification, I presume that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when you make those investments. That's the way I'm interpreting it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the last question I have or comment relating to the New England mix, um, uh, given the fact that ISO New England um, and other, you know, uh, their expectation for a number of years of continuing to need natural gas uh, for the purposes of having the backup capability in the absence of energy, other energy assurance or lack of delivery thereof. Um, has, has there been any consideration relative to the 
um, discussion that has been going on with FERC, NERC, and NSBE, the North American Electric Standards Board, relative to their gas electric interdependency studies. Just, I, that, uh, yeah, no, that has not been kind of a specific input. But that, we, but that goes to the changing mix that's coming from ISO New England, is it not? Well, there's a there's a forecast of what the mix will be, um, it, uh, you know, given uh, other states' renewable energy standards, renewable portfolio standards, and the expectation of kind of what that uh, those regulatory signals do to drive the market and and have new renewables online. Um, so there is a forecast of uh, different resources that are online. Uh, natural gas is still in New England in this model, right? That's why the societal benefits of um, actually new generation are, uh, you know, avoiding natural gas on the margin and maybe a little bit of oil or, you know, other resources. But uh, so in that, in that forecast, it's kind of like a, it's not a it's not a dispatch model, but it's a, a model that takes into account all. This is why it takes so long to run, and I didn't have updated uh, slides for you. Is it it takes into account all of the different market pressures of the regulatory pressures, plus on top of kind of the um, the marketplace, and uh, so so there is that kind of forecast of different New England regional mix. It comes directly from the avoided energy supply cost study. Which, um, you know, frankly, is being updated right now. It is like two years old. So those current conversations are not part of that mix. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Um, I, one other response to a question. I just want to be responsive because, um, Representative Sibeli, you asked about the IRA. So the IRA is included for what we know in the IRA, like the tax credits that are available for new generation, and that is a reduction to the cost. Things that are were made eligible from the IRA, like um, the solar for all program or any of the competitive programs, are not included because we just we don't know. Um, there's some, and in terms of infrastructure, the infrastructure dollars that we got are are relatively small compared to kind of the like you know the order of ten million versus a billion of like infrastructure. So we did not include um, kind of new. IRA infrastructure dollars. Brief. So uh, would you say then the final kind of projections that we're looking at will be a worst case if, if someone is concerned about, so for instance, in rate pressures. So um, we're probably presuming. I wouldn't call them a worst case. No, I think there'd just be a, I mean, if we, uh, so they're they are going to include um, they're going to include the tax credits. Um, you know, maybe it gets a little cheaper if we get money. Maybe relative to IRA, it's worst case. But there's so many um, you know uh, there's so many variables that we're kind of choosing a middle path on uh, that or we're trying to that you know they could be high or low and so i wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a worst case or a best case and we'll see the variable the inputs as part of this yes they're all they'll all be available i can um, i could pull some up if you wanted to but um yeah the model will be available you can see all the sensitivities um our report will will present on kind of the scenarios themselves that we've selected, but the, the different sensitivities will all be available. You know, there's like 70, I think, different sensitivities that are in the model. So putting those in a report would be unwieldy, but you know, they're, they are available. Yeah, um, so this is, I, I think it's more a care question, but Jay, I'm sure you're thinking about this as well. So um, here, I think I heard you say for the first time we were, a, we, had, we were an exporter again, so which then surprised me given that we keep building more and more generation. But I'm um, just, and you also mentioned, so one thing I wanted to check is, I'm guessing Vermont is like every other isolated state that, I don't know, 
are they all dealing with moments at which they're becoming exporters? And then it's ISO having to figure out how to manage all the, um, the transmission uh, utilities in order to keep ISO you know, coherent and running. Like, are, are you seeing rules from ISO about how not only to deal with uh, utilities in Vermont, but also with um, ISO as a whole? I'm just wondering if we're operating in a context and we need to be aware of what ISO is going to be telling Vermont in essence. In the case, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ISO is tracking, uh, Brian Evans Mudgeon was exactly right about there's been some additional rule changes just this week that have accelerated the need for imposition of the rules you're kind of discussing here, Senator. Um, ISO is tracking what NERC uh, is asking of transmission, North American Reliability Corporation is asking of transmission utilities. In the case of Vermont, we have an ability where Velco can do it, or if the, the distribution utilities who meet the, I think it's the 75 megawatt threshold, um, they can report directly and deal with ISO New England directly if they want. Um, all of them so far have chosen to work through us to do that. So ISO New England is tracking those NERC requirements. Also though, I think of note uh, for um, us is a requirement from ISO to do cluster studies when there's a certain amount of uh, distributed renewable generation. It, now it's not a huge category for Vermont because it's five megawatts and above. If you have a five, if you have a solar, typically it's five megawatts and above, and it's connected to a substation, along with other projects that total more than 20 megawatts. If you trip that threshold, there has to be a stop and you have to do a cluster study to see, to maintain reliability. And that means everyone stops and there has to be an imposition of costs. Uh, so that is coming. Uh, in addition, some of the <clears throat> data exchange that we're working on with the distribution utilities now, essentially Velco is, excuse me, ISO New England, we just had an innovation workshop with them Monday, uh, Monday and their view is, do what you're doing and let's see if we can learn something about how you're collaborating between the transmission and distribution utility to secure the data necessary to ensure good reliability. So ISO of its own volition, there isn't some brand new rule, we're gonna do something beyond what the federal um, North American Reliability Corporation is requirement. We will institute the practices as necessary. Um, I hope that's responsive to your question. Sure, I, I, I'm just trying to make sure that to the degree that we should be, that we're cognizant of the fact that we operate within ISO New England, and they may be making choices uh, for other for reasons other than that don't have anything to do with our RES um, that will affect the RES over time. So, uh, for instance, if we're tr if we're crossing that triggering threshold uh, increasingly frequently with more and more power. You know, how will we get managed by um, by ISO? Uh, the only thing, uh, and I would last, and then I'll get out of here. Uh, two things I would mention. One has to do with money. One of the bigger impacts on Vermonters right now has been what ISO New England and their policies relative to winter reliability and the charges that come back to Vermonters to pay for in order to keep some gas facilities running. Uh, against the prospect, if we have deep cold for an extended period of time, that could lead to reliability questions. That has led to investment and in resources, so-called out of market, and portion of those costs that flow to Vermont. That contract that cons that uh, led to that construct is is ending. Um, so that's on the money side. In terms of planning and the future and what might be happening, ISO is doing that impacts res and the like, and it kind of goes back to the earlier colloquy we had. They're planning right now is where do they see, because they see all the New England states are largely aligned on pursuing customer owned and community owned distributed uh, generation and the like. And they're saying, where do we need to have transmission investment to keep the system healthy? And they've had a few iterations. That's going to have an impact because, especially for Vermont, because of the construct of Velco and the distribution utilities and the financial model, if they deem a project that would be in Vermont as a reliability-based project, as something that gets socialized across the region, that would have a 
drastically, obviously positive impact if it wasn't something we had to um, pay for it completely. So what they see as a system and thus what's necessary for reliability investments with Vermont and the other New England states growth of renewable energy as their systems transforms, that will have an impact um, on our system. But as yet, like kind of TJ's caveats at the outset, um, we're, you know, it's early in that game. There's been some iterations and there's been a disparity, pretty wide disparity in those iterations. But that's something we're paying very close attention to. Thanks. Um, the other thing, just a quick question, uh, like you mentioned TDI with a thousand megawatts. Is that, um, should we think of that as an interstate highway that's going by with no exits in Vermont or um, how is that power going will Vermont utilities have access to it? My is recollection, that, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, please. My recollection was, first of all, it, there really is no off ramps. That was part of the appeal. And in all candor, that's why some of the groups supported it, um, because it was precisely was not having a lot of off ramps. Secondly, my recollection is, I mean, this is from 2014, was that there was a slug of power if this moved forward that would be made available to the district utilities should they want it. And I think there was some general language about the pricing about that block of power. At the time, the distribution utility said, well, look, this is we have no idea if this is going to go, but fine, if, uh, we'll put a little slug in there. And so to the degree that if it gets approval from DOE for the transmission facilitation program, which will take 50 percent up to 50 percent, likely a little bit less of offtake from that line, it's going to need they're going to need other customers. And that prospect, it could contractually. Uh, yes, there could be power that comes off that line, but electrically. It's a big whomping uh, DC line that comes through, connects at our Coolidge substation, which down Cavendish Ludlow, that gets it to the Vermont Yankee, former Vermont Yankee switchyard, which is a big energy crossroads, and it's into the New England grid from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Ken, is this a question for TJ? Uh, it's a reaction to comments, uh, Representative Sebelia and Senator Bray. Oh. Can keep it very short. <laughs> I got a lot to say, but I, I, I'll keep it to a couple of points here. Um, on, on the rate impact question, I think that's the reason I asked TJ about whether the study included flexible load management costs. I, I think there is a lot of infrastructure cost that's not factored into the DPS rate impact numbers that we'll have to talk about when we get to that a, a little more defined on where we're going. Um, to Senator DeBray's question, I, I just wanted to point out, in addition to what Carrick described, um, I'm sitting on an ICE in New England committee right now. They, they've started an engineering committee that's beside the policy, all the transmission policy issues that Carrick described. From a strictly operational standpoint, ICE in New England's got all of the utilities together talking about the fact that with the solar on the system we have right now, they're seeing hours when the voltages are too high. And they're trying to figure out how do they uh, reduce the power factor on the system to get those voltages under control. Those, those are likely to be more requirements coming down on the utilities. Um, and they presented uh, charts last meeting showing that in three to five years, there's gonna be more solar on the system um, than can be absorbed. They're actually talking about having to back down the nuclear plants during the middle of the day, which they've never had to do before. Um, and they're not quite sure how to do that without long-term storage being on the system. So we are seeing substantial impacts on the transmission system and projected severe impacts in the next three to five years if the build out continues the way it is. So here's the challenge and that I think actually being able to ask each other questions in exchange is where you need to go. And at some point I wanna make shifts into the poll results and you can pick up, that can spark some of this conversation in a more detailed way. Um, William, I saw your hand go up, but this is a brief comment. We can take it. And then I do want to shift gears to the next agenda item. Yeah, super quick. And I, I think I know the answer, but just to be sure, TJ, with regard to utility specific um, impacts or information, is that 
is it possible to pull that out of your modeling or is your modeling only only able to see statewide? Uh, it's really only a statewide model. I think you could um, scale everything to a utility and their load, um, but then when you get to the distribution impacts, that, that could be challenging. Um, and it'd be a lot of work to scale it in that way, which, which of these resources were Hyde Parks and which were WEX, and um, there we have all that information, but it, it, is, it is some work. Uh, so, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> it's hard to know where to stop. Um, William, thank you. So I have a question for the co-chairs around timing. It's 9.30 and we're scheduled to take a break at about 9.45. In fact, a break is sort of organically happening in the room from time to time as people come and go. So my suggestion is that we take a brief break to reset and then come back and start with that, with the poll results in tier one discussion. Sounds good. Go Me? Yeah. Yeah. So 15 minute break, and that means we're coming back at 9:45. And so I will not be able to join in for the rest of that. Senator Watson, thanks for joining us this morning.